You're sleeping in nature in an unfriendly environment, mm -hmm. but you're surviving just fine. Hi guys, welcome back to Paramotor Adventure Stories, the complete guide to adventure flying. Today I want to talk about Bivouac Paramotor Adventures and Ryan Southwell is here with me. We are here on our number Iceland adventure and luckily we met. So he has the opportunity to talk about Bivouac flying because Ryan has a lot of experience with that. I'm envious. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I know the two major bivouac hammer trips that you did. One was the snow caving and the other one was the sand dunes. I've seen the YouTube video, it was amazing. Thank you, yeah, quite opposites. Yeah, so let's tell this story about these two bivouac flights. And I'm sure it's interesting to the viewers and especially paramotor pilots, beginners. Our goal is to inspire pilots to do adventures like these, for example. So let's start with the snow caving. That's yes. really cool. Well, you know, the first time you do anything new or different, you learn a lot from it and you make a lot of mistakes, but uh, it was definitely up there when it comes to levels of adventure. I had never been on skis before with heavy ski boots and a full night of camping gear. Not only that, gear enough to build snow caves with and then the paramotor and, and everything else. So Shane and I had found a place up a canyon that we could take off from and he helped me get set up. And fortunately on first launch, it's a bit different when you're on skis because you can't push. So you entirely rely on the throttle to accelerate on the skis. So you're basically blowing your wing up from the beginning. As it starts to come up, you have to really lean into it to make sure that you still keep going forward, not down as it comes up. And I had enough balance with me. I looked, missed a couple of trees just enough. Is there an, like a risk of being pulled backwards? I, you, you start moving and it will suddenly stop you? No, we didn't have much of a headwind. So fortunately, if there was, I bet there would have been okay. a lot of kickback on, the, on that launch. As you build a wall and it just poof. Right, which might make it a little bit easier. You want to maybe trim out a little bit so that your wing will, will come up and go up faster as opposed to letting it hang. Because once it goes, you want it to go. No, you had nil wind. Pretty much nil wind. Yeah. Hard on the A's, pull them up, get them up, and get that speed, forward speed as soon as possible. Actually, I didn't remember that you did it on skis. Yeah. <laughs> so how was the landing? Very interesting. So our plan was to fly back up into the canyon, you know, 15 miles or so, and find a nice place to land and build a snow cave in. Did you know in advance where you want to go? When you want to land? And yeah, we had a destination in mind. Okay. And we got uh, near there, but the air was so bumpy that we were getting tossed around and we're starting to get really cold because we're flying up above and a little bit higher. We weren't flying low, uh, just for safety reasons. And uh, off, in the, little off to the left, we saw this lake, uh, just perfectly white, you know, powder snow over it. And we're like, let's just go there frozen lake with snow cover. So we assumed. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> it looks like a very inviting LZ. <laughs> yeah, so the thought was we go down, we basically do foot drags on our skis across these lake areas, but the weather was so bumpy and turbulent that we said, let's just land. And there was this little tree island out in the middle of the lake that we came in and landing is really not that bad with the skis on. It's actually, it was quite you know, simple. Like a trike, you keep the power and you level up with the power, right? Yeah, and it's easy to keep your direction straight when you're coming in for a landing, so it was no problem because being on skis, it helps to be directional. But we did that, uh, come to find out as we're stomping through, we take our skis off, put our snowshoes on, poking through, and it's a little bit slushy at the bottom. So we don't know if the lake was exactly entirely frozen or not. But anyway, so we packed our snow saws. So you landed on the island? On the lake, actually, next to the island <clears throat> as a little place to put things. But we were able to make it over to the shore. We uh, hiked our gear over to the shore mm -hmm. and uh, brought everything over and started uh, stomping the ground to pack it in tight so we can start cutting out our blocks to build like a... Oh, uh, you had the skis to cover it, right? Uh, no, we had packed snow saws. Oh, yeah. so it's that side. Yeah, tons of gear. <laughs> we had so much gear. And, and that's always the biggest challenge when you're doing these types of adventures is 
bringing just enough that you need and not overpacking because the more you overpack, it becomes more difficult. You feel like a Christmas tree. There's something hanging everywhere. Everywhere, and yeah. And then you, you can actually even have the Christmas socks. Yeah, we had uh, snow boots under our chairs. We had ski boots, which are very heavy, by the way. Yeah, it was a heavy, it was a heavy flying load, but the most interesting part was, so we, so we built the snow caves, we slept in them overnight, it was quite comfortable. How long did it take to build a snow uh, cave? A couple hours. In total, maybe we spent four hours, I would four say, hours. yeah. But they were luxurious, I mean, they're, they're fantastically built, and <laughs> it's fun to do. <laughs> to say that you sleep, you're, you're sleeping in nature in an unfriendly environment, mm -hmm. but you're surviving just fine. And that's kind of like the thrill to it to me. You're not, you're not beating nature, but you're you're getting by without a problem because you've learned a few things that help you get through it. But the big challenge was the next morning. Well, actually, we back up. That night we had a fire. We tried to break off some old dead branches on the snow, built a fire, and slowly it just started sinking. But we did it. It's freezing cold, but the fire was great. The cocoa was great. <laughs> and, uh, we just sat there, and there's nobody. How was the sky in the night? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's Milky Way is just so bright. Especially over the snow, it lights it up so much. Without a moon. Yeah. yeah, you can see everything. I love that million star hotel. Yeah. This is what I love about Bivak flying, the million star hotel. On one night, I counted 13 falling stars. I ran out of wishes, let go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go back. So I interrupted you with the night. So you said that uh, it was a very t demanding takeoff in the morning? Yeah, well, right off the bat, Shane said, it's not looking very good. Because the, I mean, we were up over 10,000 feet and uh, winds aloft, which you're practically already in the winds aloft up at that high. It, it was gusty and it was very strong mm -hmm. and switchy. And Shane was not very optimistic, but probably the biggest rule that I've learned so far in these types of adventures is that you have to find a spot that you know you can get out of. Uh, you can pick any little mountain you can land on, but can you get out of that place the next morning is probably the number one rule. If you can't get yeah. out, then you're screwed. Um, otherwise, and next thing is shelter, and then the third thing is, you know, having food and water. After that, everything is just comfort. Have you ever tried to be like flying without shelter? Just, you know, relying on the weather forecast, it should be blue sky. I don't take, you know, tents, just a mattress and a sleeping bag. No, but my next one will be. Because if I know there's going to be good weather, I'd rather not take a tent, not take anything extra. Yeah. Fuel-wise, I'd rather take maybe just a few, you know, granola bars and some water, enough food to get me by for an evening, yes. and uh, enough water to stay alive, and then the next morning, you know, just get up and and fly back. Just roll the mattress and yeah, yeah the, the less is more when you're doing this. That's a key thing that I learned on on both of my bigger adventures when I did these. I don't know. To me, it's not about the weight because today I have a small tent, 1.2 kilo single person tent is not really that much and you can this little roll you can attach to the motor you can't find places mm -hmm. but it's kind of the feeling that when I go bivouac flying and I just don't take the tent I could there's no real reasons why I shouldn't yeah and yeah I just don't take it and I just sleep under the stars it's like if you know the weather's good that's the way to go Okay, but how come that you were surprised with the weather next morning? Was your preparation wrong? Would you be now able to read the weather forecast better? Or yeah, was I, I would probably be able to read it better. But there's a lot of unknown because, you know, when you're looking at it, most of the weather forecasts come in at what your, where your location is. I'm at, you know, 4,000 feet in the mountain valleys, but when you're up there, things can change and it's not always as predictable. But it seemed like it was forecasted to be doable but ended up not being. Okay, and so what was the result? Sorry to interrupt you, but you said, now I would probably do better forecast reading. Right. I mean, this is important because we try to inspire and eventually encourage pilots to do adventures and they should learn from this. What did you learn and how later on, how would you make your forecast reading better so you are not surprised the next morning? With the right tools, using apps to look at wind forecasts. What would you look at to, for tomorrow morning to be sure or, or the overnight? That's the types of changes. If there's a drastic change, then you have to know what that is and see if it's even doable. If you don't see much changing, then you know it'll be predictable for the most part. But if you see something coming in, you see a storm on the edge, or something. it's interesting concept. Actually, I never thought about it. I check the weather forecast. Eventually, check wind at different altitudes. Yeah. But I never thought that if there is no change, is more trustworthy 
then if there is a sudden big change, yes, you're right, because yeah. maybe the change is not forecasted properly. Right. Uh, or it may come, may come earlier or maybe come earlier, more violence. A little bit off, yeah, right. In the end, it came down to us wanting an adventure. You didn't take off? I tried. Okay. So in order to do so, uh, when you're on the powder, you sink in and it helps to have a little bit of mobility to a counter for the wing, how it comes up. Uh, so we stomped out with snowshoes. Oh, just in case it comes to the side, you wouldn't be able to step right. to the if side. Right, if in the powder. If you're deep in the powder. Right. Got it. So we stomped out a, a, a runway, maybe 10 feet wide and about 30, 40 feet long. Well, that's a lot of work. Enough to get you started. But once you're in motion, you're probably okay to hit the powder and keep going. And Sheenan again said, yeah, it doesn't look very good. But I said, let's just do it. Let's just try it. And me wanting to do more than I should be thinking I should be doing is, I should have listened to him probably right off the bat, but I gave it a go. And I went up and it came up sideways. I countered and then it on skis, since not being able to turn as much, it flipped the glider to the other side, I countered and I was kind of doing this back and forth. And eventually I got out to the powder point and I was on one of those turns and I just went sideways straight into the powder <laughs> motor on <laughs> and Shane came over to- Would be a nice fluffy pfft. Yeah, well, the, the glider was just blowing a muck everywhere. And what? Shane came over, grabbed the glider from me and it took me probably um, 20 minutes just to stand up. <laughs> I was stuck and I couldn't unbuckle cause I was halfway under the snow. And my arms were trapped, my motor was okay. And then we just decided that had I been able to launch I would have ended up in Wyoming, you know, somewhere. Way, I, it was a very, it was a hidden blessing that I did not get off the ground. The bed is good at something. And I thought, well, how are we gonna get down? And so the next adventure begins. We're probably at that point 12 miles away from civilization. Anywhere. So it's a lot of work on your legs to ski with a motor on your back because it oh. pushes you down and you're, you're constantly using your thighs. And it looks fun and easy, but it's, I tell you, it's one of the hardest things to do. And so, we left our camping gear in our snow caves and we just took our motors and our skis and we had to ski down the hill to where we found a snowmobile track. And then we motored our, down the track 10 more miles to the car, wishing it was over every second. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah. So the one adventure turned into a bigger adventure with a lot of unexpected things. I mean, you don't know what's gonna happen some of the times. You know, but it was difficult. But now we have a cool story to tell. Yes, we do. I'm sure your memory is very positive about this. Oh yeah, we had a great time. Yeah. It was the worst time, but it was so great. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh, guys, we will definitely put a link to the video that Ryan did of this adventure in the description. Go and watch it, it's worth it. The next Bivak adventure that I remember of was the Glamis Sand Dunes. Yeah. That was a fun one. Yeah. I remember that video very well. It, it was a really funny video. How did you came with this idea? I'm hooked on the idea of being able to fly to places that are not as accessible to most people. And I love camping. And so it's a perfect combination to go out and have more fun. But the sand dunes are, they're warmer. In some way it's clean, it's easier and predictable and more than what you get flying in the snow up in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, the glamorous sand dunes are just a fun place to play flying anyway. And I thought, well, you know, where the campsites are, there's trains, there's generators and lots of music and lots of activity. And I thought I would love to just get out and get away from all the noise and spend an, a night under the yeah. under the stars again. And so I said goodbye to everybody, I said I'm going and did it. But it was one of the best nights ever. Yeah, you obviously enjoyed it. And I did watching your videos. It's like so fun dancing there. On the <laughs> <laughs> when you're all by yourself out in the middle of the wilderness, you know, you have a little bit of fun. Yeah, the handbrake releases and... Exactly. It's like, and that was one of the trips I was by myself on. You know, I, I never did a bivouac all by myself. Being with someone else, it's always easier because, okay, I'll break my leg. He will go, even if there's no signal, whatever, he will fly and get help. Yeah. Uh, but you were on your own. How dangerous was that? Not that dangerous, really. Um, in fact, when I flew out there, some of the other guys flew out with me and one of my new friends, Scott, he buzzed around and... He was on the little cloud? Yeah, he at least knew where I was. If I went missing... Have you had it arranged in advance? Where the location was? No, with him. With him? No. So it was a coincidence that you showed up on the same spot in well, the same time? Uh, no, a few of us, well, we were all flying out together and then I would say, bye, see you later, they fly back, I go to camp. 
Okay. But so he saw me land, and so he knew where I was going to land, and okay. or where I did end up landing, and he waved and. Would you do it on your own so no one knows whether you landed okay or you broke your neck? In a place like that, I would. I, or I tell my wife, you know, I'm going to do this at least, and we'll I'll be it. in this area pretty easily. It's a f kind of a fall evening because how would she help you? Yeah. In at least someone would know where I, I went missing. Like I was saying earlier, one of the main strategic attempts or approaches to doing these in the first place is pick a spot where you know you can get out of. Yes. And when you're doing with some of the big sand dunes, you have, if there's wind, there's the lee side, which way is the wind going to be blowing. If you're more than, you know, six miles out there and the sand dunes go like this, it's not easy to hike that far. Okay. It, it, if you go one mile and you think you've gone 10, it's very difficult. You, yeah. Every step you take, you sink halfway back every single time and the sand gets in your feet, it's heavy. And that was a big part of my thing. I found an area where I thought was going to be good and I circled around it probably three times just so I could feel the wind and look at it and think, okay, if the wind is coming this way tomorrow morning, I have this approach, I can do it. If it's coming from this way, I can do it. Yeah, if you have rolling ground, you have to consider, you know, I might be running in sand uphill, which can be difficult, or if uh, uh, downhill would have been great, but I had a little bit of an uphill. But I did have some wind enough to do a reverse launch, and so it helped me a ton. So, very exciting. Cool. I hope this was very inspiring. It was for, inspiring for me. I did paramotor bivouac flying on my own, so I have a challenge. Cool. Guys, uh, our goal is to inspire and encourage paramotor pilots to do adventure flying. And I'm absolutely sure that this was inspiring to the most. I think this is the ultimate level of adventure flying, going on your own, unsupported, and land out and stay overnight face the risk of weather changes the next day and uh, you set some very nice hints that check your weather for a cost even at a higher altitude and have a way out have a way out at all times and check how you're going to take off in different directions so the spots where you land should be possible to take off if the weather changes and this was the problem that we had when we top landed now that mountain is opening to three sides but not to the fourth where we had the wind in the morning from. yeah <laughs> uh, upon that there was cloud right at the mountain yeah. but that would be okay you take off into the fog and fly away from base and gps but the wind was from the other side so we couldn't it's good advice i learned something thank you very much yeah you're welcome Guys, thank you very much for watching this. Stay tuned for next chapters. We have crazy good stories to share, to tell that you can learn from and I can learn from as I discovered this time. Ryan, thank you for coming. Thank you. And I have a few topics that I would like to discuss with you as well. So hopefully you show up next time again. Thank you.